Welcome to my lecture online and here we are on part three, the final part, to show that yes indeed Kepler's first law that says planets move in elliptical orbits is indeed true. So continue on with where we left off. We had the equation of gravity, the force of gravity being equal to minus gm big M over r squared, which is from the universal equation of gravity. This is equal to the radial part of acceleration minus the azimuthal part of the acceleration. And then we realized that from the previous video that this could be replaced by that and this could be replaced by that. So now we have omega squared equal to this quantity right here and we have the second derivative of our respect to time equal to this quantity right here. And I probably should put a bracket around it like that so you can see the comparison. Now if we simplify that because we remember that uh, this can be simplified to this and this can be simplified to that. Now we wrote it in a very specific way. And why did we do it like this? Because notice we wrote this as u times u squared instead of just u cubed. Why did we do that? Because notice that the first part of the first term, minus l squared over m, times u squared is the same as l squared over m times u squared, and that the first term is multiplied by the second derivative of u with respect to theta, and the second term is multiplied by u. So if we factor out the minus l squared over m times u squared, we end up with this times the second derivative of u with respect to theta squared, or the second derivative of u with respect to theta plus u. All right, why did we do that? Well, then we'll come over here and we realize that u in the previous video was defined as a over b squared times 1 plus e times the cosine of theta. That was the equation of an elliptical orbit. So if that's true, then the first derivative of that would be equal to this, because the first derivative of a over b squared times 1, that's simply 0. So it's the first derivative of a over b squared times e cosine theta is a over b squared times a minus e times the sine of theta. And then when we take the second derivative, we take the derivative of sine becomes cosine again. We still keep the minus sign, so we end up with minus a over b squared e cosine theta. So what we're going to do then is we're going to substitute that into the equation over here. And we did that, so we write d squared u d theta squared of the second derivative of u with respect to theta. Well, that's going to be equal to minus a over b squared times e cosine theta plus u, u is equal to this. And then when we combine the two, notice we have a negative a over b squared, I forgot the square right there, times e cosine theta plus a over b squared times e cosine theta, so they cancel out and we're simply left with a over b squared times 1 or a over b squared. So that means that this quantity right here can be replaced by a over b squared. So this quantity right here is a over b squared, which means that this can be written as this times a over b squared, which we did right over here. And then when we manipulate things just a little bit, notice we have minus g m big M over r squared from the universal equation of gravity equals, notice we move everything to the numerator except 1 over r squared to see the similarity here. So we end up at minus l squared over m times a over b squared. And of course u squared is the same as 1 over r squared. That's how the r squared ends up in the denominator. So then what we can see is that we have a minus 1 over r squared, a minus 1 over r squared, so the numerator here must equal the numerator there. So gm big M equals l squared over m times a over b squared. If I solve that for a over b squared, which is equal to this, and then I plug that into my equation right here, a over b squared can be replaced by this. Then notice, instead of r, we, instead of u, we want r, of course, then we want the inverse of that. So instead of a over b squared, we have b squared over a times 1 over 1 plus e times the cosine of theta because we have to take the inverse of that because now we solved it back for r instead of u. So we simply take the inverse of u, which is uh, u is 1 over r, or r is 1 over u. So end up with b squared over a and 1 over 1 plus e cosine theta. And then, of course, we realize that b squared over a essentially is equal to the inverse of that, so l squared over g m squared over m. And now let's take a look at this quantity right here. Remember, we had the equation of an ellipse defined right here. So it's 1 plus e cosine theta, where e is the eccentricity, theta is the angle in the orbit that we're at, 
And A over B squared, of course, that's the semi-major axis and semi-minor axis, which are constants. But then look over here, we know that the angular momentum is a constant as well. G is a constant, small m is a constant, the mass of the planet, and big M, the mass of the sun, is a constant. So this whole thing here is a constant times 1 over 1 plus E cosine theta, which is the equation for the radius, the distance from the sun to the planet, as a function of theta. Realizing that this is the equation of an ellipse, we then show that when we replace all the aspects in such a way that instead of writing A over B squared, we write the specifics of the angular momentum of the planet, g, the mass of the planet, mass of the sun, we still have a constant times this, which makes this into an elliptical equation, which means that, yes indeed, Kepler was right, the planets do move in ellipses. It took a while to get there, but the idea was to show that the equation of an ellipse with the constant replaced by all the parameters of the planet in the orbit around the sun will still look like an equation of an ellipse, and we were able to do that. And that is how it's done. He fell asleep. <laughs> it must be boring. <laughs>